Welcome. Picked a great week to be here. We're sort of coming down on our series that we started about four weeks ago called Gridiron. And we're looking at these two words, putting them together, aggressive and then Christianity. And let me tell you, a lot of times people would think that those two words wouldn't really go together, but we've been unpacking and how they do really go together. And we've been unpacking each and every single week and looking at different areas of our Christian walk where uh, being aggressive is absolutely okay. And in fact, it's something that we're called to do in our lives. Now, what we're going to be unpacking today, and we're going to be talking about this subject right here of aggressive recruiting aggressive recruiting now i don't know if you've heard some stories about how they recruit people to play football but man some of it's ridiculous right they'll go into high schools and they'll tell these people oh, if you come play for my college i'll give you this and i'll give you that all kinds of different things that they promise them you know we'll give you money and we'll give you all kinds of money or they'll come in and say man we got the best parties ever you come be part of the, you know part of the parties or come on we have the prettiest girls ever you come be part of that some of them i heard they even are offering houses are you serious? Uh, houses for these people to come. And there's lots of people trying to stop this from happening. But what I found interesting is that when I looked at the players and I heard the players talk, you know, the players would say, yeah, they offer us all these things and we have all these different options and different things that we can do. But what the players said is what we want more than anything is we want to play the game. We want to get better as a player. We want to be a starter on the team. And for many of them, that was the one thing over and over again that made them want to go and play for the team, that they wanted to be a starter. They wanted to be on the team where they would have the power to become the best that they could possibly be where they could grow and become stronger and learn things. And a lot of times it was even to come under a quarterback and learn the ways of that quarterback and how they could play that way. These were lots of things that would draw someone in. Now, I tell you that because when we look at our lives as Christians, really, that's sort of the way that the church should be. The church, when we're looking at recruiting and bringing people into the church, people want to become the best people that they can possibly be. They want to become the best dads that they can be or the best moms that they can be or the best people that they can be. And really that's what the church is, teaching someone how to build their life on God's words and principles which enables them to be the best that they can possibly be in their life. You see, when we talk about recruiting, when we talk about getting someone for a team, we're, we're all on a team. The team that we're all on is God's team, right? The church, I mean, that's sort of what it is. And when we talk about recruiting, we are really talking about getting other people to be part of God's team, to be part of the church. Now, when we look at it, and we actually examined it in our bullseye series, when we looked at our bullseye series, we said, the bullseye of life is two things. They are the words of Jesus, where they said, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, well, it's simple. Love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like it. And he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And we said, the bullseye in life is to love God and to love people. That that's the thing that God has called us to do. And so we, when we look at our lives being part of that team, how do we measure a success? How do we measure a touchdown? How do we know when we're winning? Well, we know that when we're living a life to love God and we're living a life to love our neighbor as ourselves. See, when we're living in that way, we know that we're scoring. We know that we're moving the ball downfield. We know that we are doing what we were created to do. Now, grab your Bible and you're going to open it up to the book of Proverbs chapter 11. And so go ahead and flip open to there, Proverbs chapter 11. And uh, if you need a Bible, there should be one underneath the seat. Proverbs 11, and we're going to look at verse 30. Proverbs 11, verse 30. Here's what Proverbs 11, 30 says. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. Did you see that last part? He who wins souls is wise. Almost like there's these two things working together, that there's wisdom that comes in the life of a person who's busy winning souls. And we can hear that and we can sort of agree with that. Okay, winning souls. But I think really when we honestly think through that, then we would end up asking a question sort of like this. How do we win souls, right? Okay, winning souls is important. I get that. How do I do it? What does it practically look like in my life? 
How do I win souls? And I think, especially in our culture, maybe if we were to go through the church, the way that a lot of people would say that they win souls is simple. They say, well, all I got to do is I bring them to church, right? If I could just get that heathen neighbor of mine to church, right? Maybe something good will happen. If I can just get that, that my boss to go to church, maybe I'll get a raise. And, uh, and, and that's what we're hoping for, right? If I could just get these people to church, and that's our concept. That's our idea. That's how we win souls. That's how we reach out. I found it really interesting. I, I read this, uh, Jim Wallace, the author of The Call to Conversion, he sort of describes in his life what that was like. He said this, he said, when I was a university student, I was unsuccessfully evangelized by almost every Christian group on campus. My basic response to their preaching was, how can I believe when I look at the way the church lives? And here's how they would answer. They, they answered, don't look at the church, look at Jesus. Maybe you've heard that in your life, you know, this idea. Well, don't look at the church, look at Jesus. Or maybe you've said that. Don't look at me, look at Jesus. Or don't look at my marriage, look at Jesus. Or don't look at us, look at Jesus. You know, we, we have that. But in, in, in Jim Wallace's life, he's like, there wasn't a disconnect. You couldn't disconnect those two. And he said, I now believe that statement is one of the saddest in the history of the church. People should be able to look at the way we live and begin to understand what the gospel is all about. Our lives must tell them who Jesus is and what Jesus cares about. I think that's good words for us to know in our lives. It's not about a place to bring them to. In fact, this author, he, he wasn't looking for an organization, right? He wasn't looking for a structure. He wasn't looking for a building. You know what he's looking for? He was looking for people who were sold out to Jesus. People that were living out the words of Jesus in their life. He says, man, if I can find a group of people like that, I'm sold out to someone like that. I'm sold out to a place like that. But he couldn't find it. He could only find people that were saying, don't look at me, don't look at my life, just look at Jesus. He says, no, I need to see your life. And so we understand. He who wins souls is wise. He who, and it's not the pastor's job to do that. You know, God isn't saying it only to pastors. In fact, he's saying teachers and moms and dads and construction workers and waitresses and retirees and government workers and cashiers that win souls are wise. And you fill in your profession, whatever that is, but your job in life is to win souls. It's not about bringing them to a person to do the work for you. It's about you going out and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. You know, God is not looking for full-time pastors to do this. In fact, that's not even my job. You know, my job as a full-time pastor is to bring the church in to encourage, to equip, and then to send you out to do the work of the ministry. Church doesn't end when we dismiss because you're the church and wherever you are you're taking the church with you my job is to equip the church the work the saints to do the work of the ministry monday through saturday even on sunday afternoons or sunday evenings right when you're out there doing what god has called you to do so he's not looking for full-time pastors you know what he's looking for he's looking for full-time christians that's your role that's your job Hopefully that's where you are. And so it's, not, it's you who win souls. It's your responsibility to win souls. It's not the places building a structure to win souls. It's your job. You're a believer. You're a follower of Jesus. And so you say, all right, Greg, I get it, okay? He who wins souls is wise. It's my job, not your job. You're just trying to get off easy. No, I'm not. Uh, but I understand it's my job. I have to do it. And then we understand, okay, I get it. So then we ask the question, why don't we do it? Like, why aren't we sharing more? I mean, if Jesus truly has radically revolutionized our life, saved us, taken us from the muck and the mire and placed our feet on a solid rock, why don't we share this good news with people more often? And what I hear consistently is this answer when I ask the question, why aren't you sharing more? I hear this, I don't know how to. And maybe you're out there and that's where you are. 
I don't know how to. And I understand it when we make it difficult in our minds. Well, I don't know the right scriptures to give. I don't know the right things to say. What if they ask me questions and I don't know the answer? See, the problem is, is that we're making things so difficult in our mind when really it's so simple because what God wants us to do in our lives is simple. He simply wants us to do this. He wants us to share our stories. Your story, my story. We all have a story. I have a story, you have a story, and listen, even we as a faith community have a story. It's the narrative of our life, and it is the main way that we are called to point people to Jesus or point people to the cross. You do not have to have 100 Bible verses memorized, right? You do not need to tattoo upside down on your chest the Roman road so that when you're witnessing, if you don't know what that is, Google it later. Uh, not tattoo, Roman road. And, uh, but but, but you'll be able to read that. And say, you don't need that. You know what you need? You need that thing you already have. Your testimony, your story, what God has done in your life, how he's touched you and how he's impacted you and how he's changed you. That's what God is calling us to share. All you have to do is share the story of your faith. You know, we take the first steps, not with our heads, but with our hearts and with our mouths. When we encounter God and share his story with others, great things begin to happen. Each and every single person that's here today, you have a story to share. And your story is about what God has done in your life, past tense, but even more so, it's about what God is doing, present tense, in your life right now. Every morning when you rise and get out of bed that you have a story to share because God is moving in your life. God is doing something in your life. Flip your Bible to John chapter 4. So if you're in Proverbs, you're just going to go, keep going uh, towards the back, and you're going to come across Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the order, okay? And you're going to go to John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, there's an encounter that takes place between Jesus and a woman. Okay, now Jesus' disciples, they go off and they're trying to get food and they leave Jesus in this area. And Jesus comes across this Samaritan woman and a conversation ensues. Now, I'm going to allow you maybe to see how this would have looked like if we would change the scene a little bit. If we were to put this Samaritan woman and Jesus in a laundromat, maybe it would look a little bit like this. Here, check this out. And we see this woman who has this encounter with Jesus. It's like everything begins to make sense. Like everything that she's always believed now is standing before her. And and we see the story there is that she runs away and that she leaves. But we understand that she, in the midst of that moment, had an encounter with Jesus. Like she had an encounter and that encounter changed her, allowed her to see things in a way that she hadn't seen them before. And I got to be honest with you, she had an encounter with Jesus and each and every single person sitting around here has had an encounter with Jesus. Now your encounter is different than her encounter. My encounter is different than their encounter. But the reality is, is that we've all had an encounter with Jesus. And this encounter has changed us. See, this is something, a story that each and every single one of us have. It's God's story working through our lives. Now, we would think that as she disappeared into the dark of the night, that we didn't know what ended up happening to this woman, and we wouldn't. Except John made sure that we found out exactly what happened with this woman. As she left and went back, we read in John chapter 4, in the uh, 39th verse, we read this. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. So we see her going back into the town and sharing and many people coming to faith, many people believing because of what her testimony, well, what does it say her testimony was? Was this, he told me everything I ever did. She went back simply with the story of her encounter with Jesus. And from that story, many people came to faith. Many people came to believe. Now, let me ask you a question. How many people in your family need to hear your story? How many people at your job need to hear your story? How many people that see you each and every single day need to hear what God has done in your life? I'm going to tell you, it's many. 
I promise you that there are people that are surrounding you each and every single day who need to hear about the change that has happened in your heart. And so the question comes, all right, there's people in my life that need to hear it. The question is simple. How do we do it, right? How do we do it? I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to us. How do we open up and we share our faith? How do we share what Jesus has done? How do we share our story with others? I'm a simple guy. I like simple things. I'm going to give you three simple steps that you can do, that you could even start these today to be able to share your faith with others. The first step is easy. It's simply this, to know your story. And you look at me and say, oh, Greg, of course I know my story. It's my story. But do you know it in a way that you could share it? Do you just know it in some like way that it's all sort of pieced together in your mind? Or have you really thought through and said, wow, here's how I'd share my story? There's a great resource for you, billygram.com. If you get on billygram.com, there's all kinds of resources that are free to help you share your faith with others. One of those that I was really intrigued by that I thought could really help everybody here in church today was it's called What's Your Story Questionnaire. It's basically a piece of paper with three simple questions on it. The first question was this. The first question was, what was your life like before God? And you only had 100 words to describe what your life was like before God. Think about that right now where you're sitting. What was your life like? What are some words that you would use for that? Maybe chaotic? Maybe sad? Maybe filled with anger or fear? or Whatever your story is, you think about that, and these words begin to describe maybe these situations that you found yourself in. You begin to describe what was your life like before you had the peace of Jesus in your life. You begin to think about that. The next question is simply this. The next question is, how did you receive Christ? And with this, you could even include a Bible verse. Like, where were you? What happened when you received Christ? Maybe someone shared the good news of Jesus with you. Maybe you were sitting in a, in a venue. Maybe you were sitting in a church. Where did you hear that good news of Jesus? You answer these questions. You say, how did you hear? What did you hear? And how did you respond to that thing that you heard? See? And you just do that in 300 words or less. Maybe you put a Bible verse in there, something that came up that made you think. Something, maybe for some of you it was a testimony. For some of you, you heard someone share their testimony, their story, and their story hit your story, and you opened up your heart and your life to God. That would be included in this part. What was it about their story that touched you so much? What was it about what they said that made such a profound impact on you? And then after we do that, after we say what happened, then the final question is this. We simply ask, what is life like after receiving Christ? So we say, what, what is your life like now? So we look at it. Here's where I was before. Here's the situation that took place that brought me to a place of faith. And here's where I am currently in my life. Perfect? Absolutely not. If so, I want to see you walk on water later. All right? We're not perfect. We're never going to be perfect, all right? It's not about perfection, guys, but it's about understanding where I was and where I am. And if you're walking with Christ, I'm, I hope that you're light years from where you were. You've got to be able to communicate that and share that. So that's the first step, right? Now we have our story. Now we know our story. We, we, we can be able to share it in a logical way. Now, the, the second key, though, is equally as important as the first, is that you have to come to peace with your story, you have to come to terms with your story. For example, there's many of you here that when we begin to look at where we were, some of the things that we've done, some of the places that we've been, we find these feelings of shame coming, this idea of being embarrassed about some of the things that we've done in the past. Or maybe it's not shame or embarrassment, but maybe for some it's sadness. You're sad about some of the things that you did. Or maybe for some it's regret. And so we have these feelings or these emotions tied with our story, and we find ourselves in this place where we don't want to share because when we share, there's this regret, or when we share, there's this shame associated with it. Listen, I struggle with that in my life too. I made lots of mistakes, and I did lots of things. You know, I remember being at a place where I wanted to take my very life and being like, man, I don't want to share that with people. And then God began to open up my heart and, and said to me this. He said, do you remember that dark place you were? I was like, yeah. He said, Greg, there's people that are in that dark place right now. You, you now have the light. They don't have the light. You need to take your story and share it with them. They're there. They'll relate when you tell them about wanting to end your life. They're going to relate when you talk about, uh, you know, uh, just, just wanting to, to finish it off. They're going to relate to that. 
But then you can say, that's not where your story ended. You begin to point to me, and you begin to point to light and life. And God just began to speak this to my heart. And I said, you know what? I'm never going to be ashamed of my story. I'm never going to be ashamed of my mistakes. And let me tell you, I've made a bunch of them. But I'm never going to because God redeemed my life for his glory. And if my stupidity in the past can bring glory to him today, he can have it, right? And same thing with your stupidity, right? (laughs) Sorry, I just didn't just imagine yourself taking all of that, those broken pieces and all that junk, right, and just lifting them up before God and saying, it's all yours. Say, God, if you can use this mess, use it. If you can use these mistakes, use it. I give it all to you. I'm not going to keep it hidden anymore. I'm not going to be in this place of shame. So you got to come to peace with your story. And then the third step is this. So we figured that we know our story. We've come to peace with our story. The third step is real simple. That's the place where you begin to share your story. You begin to open up and you begin to share about what God has done in your life. And I want to promise you that there are people all around your life right now that desperately need to hear what God has done in your life. The only reason they're not hearing is because you haven't chose to share it. So you have to begin to share it. Now, I got to warn you that there's one final hurdle to this. Because the minute that you get the strength of the idea that you're going to share it, this final hurdle is going to rear its ugly head. And it's simply this fear, right? You're going to be scared. Well, what if they don't like what I say? What if they argue with me? What if they don't like G? What if this happens? What if that happens? And you know exactly what I'm talking about because a lot of you have experienced that fear in your life. Here's what I want you to do. If you've ever struggled with fear, I want you to think back in your life to those people who first spoke to you about Jesus. I want you to picture them in your mind. I want you to think about who those people were that shared the good news of Jesus with you. Are you upset with them that they spoke up to you? Or are you angry with them because they shared the good news of Jesus with you? Are you mad at them that they would answer God's call and talk to a heathen like you? (laughs) No, you're not. You're grateful and thankful, and maybe even if you were to see him again today, thank you so much for sharing the good news of Jesus. My life has been changed and radically revolutionized. Thank you so much for opening up. Thank you for not keeping it to yourself. You're ecstatic and you're overjoyed about the impact that these people have had on your life. Let me ask you, why are you robbing someone else from having those same feelings about you? Fear, right? Fear is the thing that stops you, but you have to realize and stop letting fear stop you from bringing that same joy that you currently have in your life into their hearts and into their lives. Listen, today, today is the day where this needs to end. Today is the day where we need to make a decision in our lives that we are going to shine bright for Jesus in our world, that we're not going to keep it hidden, but we're going to allow it to shine bright because it impacted our lives, and there's people in our world that desperately need to hear the good news of Jesus, and you're the one that has that news resting inside of you. I'm going to finish with one story. It's a, it's a story about a bartender, and uh, he was a bartender in England, and he worked and he served many people throughout his time there, and Every day, people would come into the bar and, and they would pour out their hearts to him and they would share their innermost sorrows, their regrets, the things that they wish they hadn't done that they did. And he would stand from behind the bar and he would serve them drink after drink as they would drown their problems in a bottle of booze. One day, he, he, he ended up leaving that profession, but he never forgot that time. One day, this individual opened up his heart and he opened up his life to Jesus He heard the gospel message, and he reacted to that. He said, this is what I want in my life. And he invited Jesus into his heart. He committed his life to Jesus, and he was gloriously saved. But God called him. God said, I put something in your heart. I need you to share that good news with other people. I've changed you so that you can help change others. And he began to stand up and he began to preach to people, share the good news of Jesus with people. He preached all over the country of England, right? Shared the good news of Jesus with all kinds of, until finally he crossed the ocean and came to the United States of America. He landed in America. He came to the United States and led thousands to accept Christ as Savior. In fact, it's said that over 70,000 people accepted Christ under the preaching 
of this one man. And this is before TV, right? I mean, this was a, a miraculous thing. Over 70,000 people reached by this one man. Now, you may ask, who, who was this man? Who was this bartender turned evangelist? Well, this individual, his name was George Whitefield. Now, you may not even know George Whitefield. I say that and it, does, it doesn't ring a bell with you. But listen, it's not about George Whitefield and it's not about the past. It's about who's the bartender behind Mecca today that there's 30,000 souls resting inside of them that they need to reach because there's a call on them, but no one's opened up to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. It's about the person working behind the register at Alco or the person down at Circle K or the person in your family that you've never shared the good news that God has a plan and a purpose for. There's a seed resting inside of them just waiting to be germinated, but you have to be the one to come in and bring water and, and fertilizer to that seed to allow that thing to grow to impact the lives of many. I imagine how many seeds aren't germinated today. Because the church stands in fear to share about the change that has happened in their heart and their life. I'm going to tell you, those days need to end. God is calling even in the midst of this church body for a people to rise up and say, no longer will we let fear stop us from sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. That we will choose to stand and we will share our story. We will share about what God has done in our life. And guess what? We're not going to get it right every time, but we're going to share with a pure heart. And we're going to see lives change because let me tell you, as you get out and you begin to water that soil, as you begin to share, you're going to see seed after seed begin to bloom and begin to blossom. You're going to see lives changed. I love even at the beginning of our day, we saw Megan's uh, testimony on, on the video. And that was the one thing she said, I love sitting back and watching lives be transformed. Why is that? It's because seeds, the seed that's growing is beginning to bloom and blossom in the lives of people. And that seed is germinated by you opening your mouth and sharing your story with someone else. Does that make sense? Now remember, this church is not a church where we just hear things and forget it. We are a church of action. We are consistently going to call you to action. I need you to grab your bulletin that you have it inside that bulletin. I put a special gift for you. It looks like a bookmark a little bit. It's about this size. Grab that and put that in your hand. It was put out by our friends at the Billy Graham uh, Association. And uh, that's a tool for you. So you got homework this Sunday. I want you to take that thing home with you, and I want you to read through it. It's about how we can share our faith, how we can bring our friend, how we can reach out. And right at the bottom in yellow, there's about six different spots that's empty. It's blank right now, but by next week, I want to see them filled up. And I want you to see you put the names of people, people in your life, Maybe it's your favorite barista down at Starbucks, right? Uh, maybe it's, it's your favorite teacher if you're a student. If you're a teacher, maybe it's your favorite kid if you have one of them. And, uh, you know, may, it maybe it's somebody in your life, but you just, you fill in those blanks. And then when that card, when you see that card, I want you to begin to pray for those six people. And here's your prayer. God, open the door and allow me the opportunity to share my story with this person. That's it. That's simple. We, we already figured out how to do that. You're going to be working on that. Th God, will you open up the door and allow me to share my watch because my story is your story and your story needs to be heard by them. Make sense? All right. And if we do that, that's called aggressive recruiting. That's called aggressive witnessing. That's called get out there and doing what God has called us to do. Not hiding it, but allowing it to shine bright. Can we pray? Bow your heads with me. Father God, I thank you so much, Lord. I thank you that you're raising up, Lord, an army in the midst of these walls right now, an arm, your army, to stand up strong for you, to reach out outside of themselves, to be people of courage, to be people that will stand strong, to be people that will reach out, to be people who will fearlessly share your word with those in their lives. I pray, Father God, that that seed that is planted even in their hearts will bloom and blossom and grow. And maybe there's some here that you've heard this message today, maybe even for the very first time, and you say, man, this, this is what I need in my life. I, I need that seed to bloom and blossom. I need Jesus in my heart. I need Jesus in my life. Maybe some of you, you've heard of Jesus, but you ran away, and now you're coming back. 
For others, maybe you've never heard this news, but you're hearing it for the very first time today. Listen, today's the day to turn to him. Today's the day to give it all to him. If you're here and you hear my voice and you say, man, that's what I want. I want to commit it all over to him. I'm tired of doing this thing on my own. And you want me to say a prayer with you? I, I'd love to say a prayer with you right now. All you simply got to do is just lift up your hand. I'm not going to call you to front. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just lift up your hand. All right, I see you right back there. Who else would say, yes, today is that day. That's what I want in my life. I want to commit my life to Jesus today. I see you. I see you. Is there anyone else that says, yes, I see you. I see you. His hands all over here saying, yes, today is the day. Today is the day. Well, let's pray. And if you're here and you've already committed your life to Jesus, I want you in support of those that are praying that prayer for the first time. I want you to pray this prayer with them. Simply say this. Say, Jesus, I believe that you have a plan for my life. I don't understand it all. But I lay my life down and give it all to you. Use me for your glory. Forgive me for those things I've done that has taken me further from you but I commit to run after you today and every day for the rest of my life amen